Well, it's good to see you all here this day as we continue on our sermon series, Wise Choices. And today we're going to be looking at how to receive God's vision. Uh, and the past, past few weeks we've been looking at uh, different things. Like, for instance, a couple of weeks ago we talked about how God is trying to speak to us, trying to call to us and lead us in, his, in our lives as a good shepherd. Uh, then last week we talked about, well, not every voice that you're going to hear is necessarily going to be from the Lord. And you have to have some wisdom, some discernment in which voice is His and which voice to follow. And today I wanted to look at, okay, so now that we're clear about those things, how do I receive that voice, that vision from God, that impression from God? And as we begin this, this day, I want to just to suggest that you might think about maybe an important uh, decision or choice that, that you're going to have coming up sometimes in the, in the future or sometime in this year. And you might want to think about how to, to use this sermon in order to go about making that decision in order to listen to the Lord. But before we do that, uh, I would invite you to turn to your sermon series prayer. We should have that. God, you have made me free to choose. Help me make wise choices this year. When doubts and uncertainties arise, Give me the grace to ask you what you would have me to do. Save me from false or bad choices. Settle my heart and mind so I can listen to and follow you. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise that you are here with us this day, that your spirit is here to speak to us, to guide us, to encourage us, to lead us. Help us as we listen to this message, uh, this word from the book of the prophet Habakkuk, your prophet, to be instructed in how to, to come before you, how to hear you, and how that you can bless our lives. We'd ask also a special blessing this day that as we have entered into your house this morning to come before you, that you would help us in our hearts and minds to sense and see the presence of Jesus among us. We ask these things in his name. Amen. You want to look at the first four verses of chapter two of Habakkuk. Uh, this is really a very famous passage, uh, and one of the most famous is actually in the history of Christianity, especially verse four, where it talks about that. Well, it's frequently translated, "The just, the righteous shall live by faith." But what I really want to do is talk about how I, I, how Habakkuk had uh, complained, had a worry, a concern, didn't know exactly what to do, and so he comes before the Lord in order to ask. And how does he do that? You see there, I want to invite you to pull out your sermon notes this morning. There's some great blanks in there we're going to fill out as we go through this. And the first is, how can I receive God's vision for me? Number one there, I must want to do God's will. I must want to do God's will. Uh, this starts out this little passage, Habakkuk says, I will. In other words, he makes a choice, he makes a decision that he's going to come before the Lord, that he's going to listen to him and be guided by him. Because, hey, you can't hear God unless you, you want to hear him. You're willing to do what he says. You're willing to follow him. Uh, in the fifth century, there was a guy, the, a Christian writer that wrote down this. He said, the faithful, that is, Christian believers, don't want to hear from God what they desire, but want to desire what they hear from him. That is to say, we don't come before the Lord in order for Him just to kind of uh, validate our impressions and, and validate our wants, but rather, we want to hear from you, Lord. You are the one with true wisdom. You are the one with true understanding. And we want you to lead us. That's our desire in our hearts. Let me ask you something. How much do you really want to hear God? How much do you really want to hear Him guide you? I mean, it would be kind of, maybe, maybe it would be kind of nice or is it uh, really a necessity in your life? You have a desire. I want to hear God. I want Him to lead me. I want Him to uh, give me the purpose for my life and move me forward in my life. Do you have that hunger in you? If you look at uh, Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, verses verse 4, 29, what it says is this is the person who's going to find the Lord. The person who seeks Him with all his soul and heart. Do you have a heart this morning to listen to God? To let him speak to you. Number one, this is what the prophet did. Number one, I, he, I must be willing to want to do God's will, to hear, hear him and do what he wants. Number two, I need to get alone with God. I need to get alone with God. Uh, that is where the Habakkuk says, you know what I'm going to do, Lord? I've got this question. I've got this complaint. I want to bring it before you. And so what I'm going to do is, he says, I'm going to climb up in my watchtower, which is his way of saying, I'm going to take some time off. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be before the Lord and listen. Now, look, that is difficult for us to do. 
I mean, we have so much coming at us from so many different directions, from so many different ways in our life. We're constantly pulled this way and that way uh, that the velocity of our lives is kind of picked up and we're doing and doing and doing and going, going and going and hearing and hearing, you know, all kinds of stuff in the media. And so it's difficult for us to get along with God. But it's not impossible. It can be done. Let me just give you an example. Many, many years ago, there was a lady by the name of Susanna. Her name was Susanna Wesley. Have anybody heard Susanna Wesley before? Susanna Wesley had uh, 18 children. Now, just have that dream amongst you there. All right. Now, some of you might think that's a nightmare. I don't know. Uh, but 18 children. And uh, every day what would happen is she would get before the Lord. And in fact, she had, if you remember, she had two sons named John and Charles, who were kind of the co-founders of the Methodist movement in England and, and really changed the history of Christianity. In fact, you're in a Methodist church this morning. And they wrote hundreds of hymns. And actually, the last hymn, I think, today was written by Charles Wesley. And what they said was they got their love of the Lord from hearing their mother pray. And this is how she would do with 18 kids running around the house, right? She would get in her rocking chair and she would take her apron and she would pull her apron up over her head. You can imagine that, can't you? She would pull her apron up over her head and she would pray and she would pray for an hour and a half each day. And the kids knew that when mom was sitting in the rocking chair with the apron up over her head, you did not disturb mom because she was before the Lord. Because she understood she needed that. And it, it influenced and changed the lives of her children when she did that. Now, what about Jesus? What did he do? If I gave you a quote there from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Luke 5, 16. <clears throat> and uh, it really is, it's translated in a variety of different ways. I went back yesterday and I looked at the original language. And if I was to translate it, I would translate it like this. Jesus had a habit of going out into a lonely place, a deserted place, a wilderness area, something like that, and pray. He had a very busy life. People were constantly wanting something from him, but he decided, no, I got to stop, and I got to go out and be by myself and be with my Heavenly Father. And he did that every day. We need that every day. And it can be done, but you got to work at it. You got to make a habit out of it to spend the time to get along with the Lord. That's exactly what the prophet did. That's what Santa Wesley did. That's what Jesus did. If I'm going to hear him, I got to get along with him. Now, there's a reason for doing that. And you'll see number three there. I need to calm my thoughts and my emotions. I need to calm my thoughts and my emotions. Uh, back up there, uh, two one. I will wait. That is to say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to station myself. Some translations say, I'm going to basically, I'm going to stop. I'm going to slow down. And I'm going to calm down. And I'm going to let my mind and my emotions get settled down. Now, uh, years ago, just to give you an example of how this could work, there was a guy that I knew, and what he would do is, he would say on Friday afternoon, he would get his pickup and he'd throw his tent in the back and he'd throw some camping gear in the back and he'd throw his uh, lawn chair in the back and he'd get his Bible in there and he'd get his pad, his notebook, notepad and some pens and, and he would head out and he would go out to a farm or he would go out to a park or something like that and he would get out in an isolated area and he would stop the pickup, he would turn off the radio, he would turn off his cell phone, he would put up his tent, he would put up his lawn chair and he would get a stick and he would take the stick and he would make a big circle around his, his pickup and around his tent and that's as far as he would go. And he would stay within that circle for the day, the next afternoon, or maybe if he was going to stay there for most of the weekend, he'd stay there a couple of days. And he would sit in his lawn chair. He would read the scripture. He would pray. He would journal on his notepad. He would put down impressions and leadings that he had received from the Lord. He would sit in silence before the Lord. He would look at creation and, and the glory of God that he saw in creation, and he would get there before the Lord and get calmed down. See, when you get calmed down, you get sensitive to God's thoughts that he wants to place in your mind. Now, you're going to have resistance to that. 
There's some things that are going to kind of try and get you off of that. And so let me just point out three of them. The first one is commitments. Commitments. Have you ever tried to settle down and all of a sudden you got a hundred different things popping up in your head? Oh, I've got to go do this. Oh, I forgot to go to the pharmacy. Oh, I forgot to call the kids. Oh, I forgot. You ever had that happen to you? That's going to happen. So this is how you solve that. You have that, pa that notepad and you got a pen right beside you and the, you know, you're sitting there praying and it hits your brain. Oh, I didn't. Do uh, okay, let me write that down. Now you can go away. I got you down. Goodbye. And you just let that go and you go back to praying and maybe something else lit it. Okay, and you stop and you write that down. That might take, you might have 20 things you get written down there. But eventually that will stop. Now, that's not the only thing that'll hit you. It might be not only commitments, it might be conscience that'll hit you. And you'll be sitting there before the Lord and you'll think to, my, think to yourself about all your faults and your failings and your foibles and the things that you've done wrong. And, and oh, I remember 20 years ago when I did this or I did that. And, and you know, feel some guilt about that or feel some shame about that. And this is how you deal with that. You stop and you say, but God loves me. Yeah, i would made some mistakes. Yes, I shouldn't have said that to my spouse or to my kids or to my friends a couple of days ago. But there's forgiveness for me. He loves me. I'm part of his family. And so I'm going to commit that to his love. You let that go. Commitments, conscience, compassion. Oh, wait a second. I don't know if I've got enough time to do that because this person needs me or that person needs me or I've got to go and take care of this person or, or help this per that person out. And I hear what you're saying. Uh, believe me, in the ministry, I get driven by that a lot. But wait a second. Go back and read Luke 5, 15, and 16. And it says that, man, the, you know, the message about Jesus goes out through the countryside, and there are people that are coming to him to be taught the word, and there are people that are coming to him to be healed. And Jesus says, oh, I hear what you say. I understand you got these needs. I'm out of here. And he goes off by himself to pray because his first relationship, you're my first relationship is with who? God, it's with the Lord. And that's where we have to prioritize our time and say, he's first. I understand you got needs. I understand I need to help that person, but he's got to take time. He's got preference because he's the Lord. And so we sit and we wait Quietly, quietly, patiently, expectantly that he will speak to me. Okay, so we're out there and then this happens. Number four there, I need to watch and let God give me an impression. Now this is what the Habakkuk saying, I will wait and see what God says. You think God can speak to you? You think he's interested in, in leading you? You know, I, I have a degree in, in science and uh, I'm still kind of fascinated by what's going on. And I was reading this week uh, about something that's gonna happen in 2022. That's the guess is 2022. In 2022, what you're gonna be able to do is at the night, night you can go out and you'll be able to look up in the sky and there will be a new bright star up in the sky that you'll be able to see in 25 years from now. And what's going to happen is there is a binary star system that the stars are collapsing in on each other and they'll collapse in and they'll produce a red nova so that in 2022, more or less 2022, you'll be able to go out and you'll see this new star out in the sky, this bright star. And that happened 1,800 years ago. In five years from now, you'll be able to see something that happened 1,800 years ago. Now look, if God can present to you in five years from now a vision, an image of something that happened 1,800 years ago, do you think that he can place in your mind now a thought, a word, a leading, an image? Of course he can. Now, sometimes it's visual. Sometimes it's like, say, Joseph, who you may remember his, uh, his dream that he had where the stars, 13 stars had gathered around him and they bowed down to him. That was one way that God speaks. 
Sometimes it's like uh, Philip. You may remember Philip in the Acts of the Apostles where uh, Philip's walking along and, and uh, God says to him, I, I need for you to go up to that chariot over there. Sometimes it's his word, but God is interested in guiding you. Uh, you know, like uh, it says in James 1, verses 5 and 6, where James says this, he says, Anyone here who lacks wisdom, let him ask it of the Lord, and God will give it to him, and give it him generously and ungrudgingly. God wants to speak to you, to guide you, to give you wisdom, because he loves you and he's concerned about you. Now, there's a fifth thing, and this is important. This is what the prophet, the God had the prophet do. Now, you'll see there on number five, I need to write it down. I need to write it down. Look at what he says there. And then God answered, write this, write what you see. So you're listening to the Lord, and, and he says something, he, he suggests something. Oh, yeah, I never thought about that. Get out that pad and write it down as much detailed as you can. Now, why would you do that? Because what's going to happen is you're going to leave your prayer time and you're going to go out and the day, your daily life is going to hit you and, the, and the, somebody's going to call you and you've got to go run down to the grocery store or you've got to do this, that, and oh, I forgot to go buy and get some gasoline and, the, you know, and all this is going to go on. And you're going to get pulled in every which way. And if you will take that and write that down and then set an alarm. You gotta, if you've got a smartphone... Set an alarm in about 24 or 48 hours, and it says this, read. Read it. And then in 24 or 48 hours, after you've, ever, after you've been pulled every direction, if you go back and read what you wrote in that time of prayer, all of a sudden it's going to go, oh yeah, this is the direction I'm supposed to go. This is what I need to do. This is how I need to think about that problem. Because we get swamped. And we get pulled away from what God is trying to speak. And so if we'll just journal it, we can come back to it and be strengthened and directed. Now, finally, let me suggest something that we really need to do. We need to, as we go through this, think, give thanks and praise to God. You know, if you look at Habakkuk 3.2, go over to the next chapter, he says this. He says how... Utterly in awe I stand, O God, at your works. God is at work to lead your life because He loves you, He knows you, He knows the details of your life, and He cares about you. And yes, there are going to be struggles, and yes, there are going to be difficulties, and it's not all going to get solved. That's the reality of life. But even in that situation, he'll walk with us through it if we'll let him. And we need to thank him and praise him for him being willing to speak to and to encourage and lead us. Let's pray again. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are here with us this morning to speak to us, to give us an image, an impression of what you want for us. As we come before you in your house this day, we'd ask that you would give us a sense of your love for us, of your encouragement for us, for all those choices that we're going to have to make, sometimes major choices that are facing some of us. We give you thanks. We don't have to walk through those alone, and we don't have to depend upon ourselves that you are here to help us. Give us wisdom to take the time, the tenacity, in order to get with you and listen to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.